Welcome aboard the Themed Attraction Podcast, where we take you for a ride through the fascinating world of theme park design, that is. You've just set sail with us on a voyage of discovery and discussion with theme park industry masters of the craft. So you've worked with so many different executives, the Disney C-suite executives that you worked for, what, a half dozen or more. And um, as a creative uh, in this industry, what is it like to work through that and your interaction between them? How, how is it as a creative to work in that environment? Well, it's difficult. <laughs> okay, we're done. Uh, I, I guess I'd parallel it with uh, the animation department because they're kind of our, you know, ghost partners. In we never work together, but we sympathize with their relationships too. And if you look at that group under, you know, the management that remained after Walt's passing, the I guess you'd characterize a lot of it like would Walt do this or maybe Walt would do this or here's something we didn't develop that Walt saw maybe we can develop that and so there isn't much passion for I have this idea that's burning a hole in me and it's got to get out there it's got to be it's like Mm -hmm. well maybe this will work and you know John told a story of in some office John Lasseter um, being told you weren't hired to come up with ideas you were hired to draw so get back to your table and draw. Mm. And he was trying to convince them to explore 3D animation with mm. where uh, where the wild things mm. oh, right. go or whatever the, the wild the things wild are. Things are. Mix, Murray Sendek's book. And um, that's sort of, I think, uh, a, a situation you uh, run into when you're dealing with caretaker management mm-hmm. that's been given a task of, we don't want to mess anything up and this guy was great and we've got to do what he wanted. Uh, but then you don't bring anything new to the table. And then, you know, this exuberant Disney had kind of dug a hole. And so when Michael Eisner and Frank Wells came in, you know, going out of a hole, which is negative zero, negative zero, getting, there's nowhere to go. The song that ends Mary Poppins returns, there's nowhere to go but up. Uh, yeah. You know? yeah. And it's a wonderful song. And, and it says so much about them coming in. You know, Katzenberg just revived the animation with Roy mm-hmm. Disney and, uh, you know, they came over, they admitted they knew nothing about building parks, mm-hmm. they would learn, and they. I was lucky to be one of the people they trusted. Mm-hmm. And so they looked at my accomplishments and they said, that's a pretty good bank account. I'd done Journey into Imagination, I'd done um, the uh, Big Thunder Mountain, and I had several other concepts in work, Star Wars, and they turned that on right away. It was all in one day. They came over on a Saturday, and he brought his young son, Breck. This is Michael's son, Breck Eisner. And he says, Breck's 14. He loves theme parks. I don't know anything about theme parks. So I hope you don't mind if he gives his opinion. And I go, great, my career. But <laughs> like it was big. great. Be big. It was, yeah. Because I had never given a presentation to my audience. Yeah. My oh, eventual. Wow. So you're always converting it to make it appealing to people that are dealing with, <laughs> will the stockholders you know, think we're crazy yes. investing and all this. And here's a kid. He goes, Dad, that's awesome. You know, and then I, and he says, Okay, what else have you got? We're doing that. What else? Yeah. And like that, we were doing Star Wars, Star Tours. And then uh, I had Splash Mountain, and I'm going, He won't like Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Bear and all that. He's 12 years old. So I really featured the dip drop yeah. in the middle in the dark, and that you'd have this highest, steepest <laughs> waterfall. And then I, I slipped in the story of, of uh, Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox and all that. And he said, Dad, that's even better than the Star Wars attraction. Wow. <laughs> I go, hey, okay, we're doing that. So these open like what, next year or the year after that? <laughs> and see, they knew nothing about five years for Splash yeah. Mountain, three years for... And, but they, yeah. they really jumped and they said, okay, you take the time you need for that, but you're not going to tell me you can't have a movie here next year, next summer. So who's the hottest director? Coppola. Who's the hottest you know, young star today? Michael Jackson. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Um, so get them together and then bring in George Lucas just for good measure. And then he looked at all of us and said, they will have a movie here. You have the theater to put it in for next summer. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that was how Captain EO happened. You know, wow, just crazy. like that. And that's how the preview yeah. uh, outside the ride so, so forward. I mean, come yes. up. <laughs> you go from caretaker, like, what are we going to do? And what, you know, won't, won't rock the block, block, 
box and everybody will think this is just like Walt would do and all that to we want to shake this up and show people there's life and mm-hmm. vitality in Disneyland. And so the whole idea that scared everyone to death of Star Wars coming in with Lucas mythology to Disneyland was suddenly that is going to say something to the people we want it to say that mm-hmm. Disneyland is part of the modern yeah. world. Mm-hmm. And Michael Jackson having an attraction at Disneyland is going to say a ton. Yeah. yeah. So that's the second flavor. I think now it's sort of, you know, the third group is is strong management from a business end that lets its divisions do their own thing rather than there being a corporate, you know, synergy. So you look at Marvel, which is doing amazing things. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at Lucasfilm, which is still on top. You look at Pixar. You look at Disney Animation. You look at the attractions. But I don't think there's quite the we all get together for... Uh, picnics and stuff that we actually did. I remember asking the TV guys, what are they working on and what what's the big things coming? Mm-hmm. I don't think that happens. I think each group now is charged with not letting any other group get better than they are, you know, mm-hmm. so there's sort of a competitive, you know, carrying the weight, you know, of mm-hmm. each of the divisions. And that brings a different kind of challenge because you go from corporate management and, and wise divisional management sort of sits back and let the corporate people say, because they know they're going to say anyway, to now the divisional management has to make the actual calls. And if they're right, they're going to get yeah. rewarded. If they're wrong, they're going to take the blame. You yeah. know, so whereas before in, in the Michael Frank era, you know, you could throw your hands up and say, I'm only doing what they wanted me to do. And you'd probably be fine. Uh, you know? So yeah. I didn't have a problem with that because I, I was completely compatible with their way of thinking. Mm. And they were completely supportive of my idea. So that was great. And my management at the WDI level was supportive of, we like the fact that they like Tony and the things come out good and all of that is working. (laughs) But when Frank died and, and Jeffrey spun off DreamWorks out of the animation, you can look at what happened to those animated films. They went from the greatest movie Lion King uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Beauty, and the, Beauty Beast, and the Beast to Aladdin. what is it Home on the Range and yeah. uh, The Emperor's New Groove yeah. and things like that that not bad but they're not classics yeah. in a sense that um, so you know I think that's you, you're kind of batted around and you know your working style has to adjust to the, the way in which they want you to perform and so you're not always given the opportunity of being as best as you possibly can if you want to survive in a corporate thing. A lot of people will take that cue when there's a, a traumatic change in management like that to leave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go out and do your thing. And then when everyone goes, we really have gotten ourselves into a problem here, you're the first one to come back because they're all going, he was smart enough to see the yeah, writing on the wall yeah. and he got out and now he's done these things on the outside. Let's bring him back yeah. because maybe he can pull us out mm-hmm. of the rut. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, you know, there's no formula of how to work under those things. You decide for yourself, I work best in this way, I can survive in this way, and I'm going to fail in this way. Yeah. And if you're going to fail in that way, you better get out, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, because you're not going to help yourself or them. Yeah, oh, that's great. Know. Tony, I'm curious. On, um, you know, I just wrote a, a little essay for um, themedattraction.com, our blog, on, on the value of backstory. You know, and yet... You've certainly used employed backstory, um, you know, certainly for an individual attraction, for a shop, an environment. But when you're looking at the scale of an entire land, um, and I'm thinking of like uh, frontier lands uh, in Disneyland Paris, you know, where there's kind of a continuous Mm storyline and it Mm -hmm. ties into this actual fictional town and the Haunted Mansion, the Phantom Manor is actually related to Big Thunder and related to. Um, is there pros and cons with that versus. Well, yes, there is. (laughs) I I think, you know, backstories and. Michael is dying to ask a question, so after we finish this one. Uh, (laughs) Backstories, I think it's a cliche that's gotten overused, and you got to be careful with it. It should be there to inform the designers, but if it gets too complicated where, you know, you're trying to explain it to guests or something, and they can't understand the concept without an explanation, you're in trouble. And I, I won't give any... There's some recent examples that I feel are way too intellectualized. Uh, but let me give you one that's I think can be talked about safely now. You, you mentioned Frontierland, Fantasyland, 
Adventureland and Tomorrowland. Those are so clear both from the design standpoint and the visitor standpoint that you could stand a family with children and grandparents and say, do you want to go to the world of tomorrow, the world of fantasy, the world of the Western frontier or into deepest adventure land? And you kind of know the world. And so would a designer know if I've got to build a ride for that area or an attraction, I know what to do. Mm. Go over to California Adventure and on opening day, <clears throat> we had a major area called Condor Flats. What do you build there? Do you build things where we watch buzzards eating roadkill? <laughs> I don't know. And I tried to explain that. I said, you know, if you take soaring and the river raft mm -hmm. and the climbing trail, the nature climbing trail or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and ask yourself, is there a categorical blend on that? I would say it comes close to being California extreme. Mm -hmm. And in the morning when the kids run in, I put myself into like, okay, I'm a kid and I've got my thing. Let's go to California Extreme. I want to ride the, rock, the raft ride. I want to go soaring on a hang glider and I want to climb in the trees and everything. And if I'm a designer, okay, we need a new attraction for California Extreme. Mm -hmm. So you're immediately thinking, what could we do with surfing, skiing, yeah. uh, all of yeah. the things that, you know, that would ignite it in your, and strengthen the land? Yeah. So it becomes stronger because it's got a new e-ticket that lets you ski or lets you, you know, surf or whatever that continues to build on that the same way that bringing Indy to Adventureland mm -hmm. strengthens Adventureland. So, you know, I think backstory to that level, what is California Stream? Nothing other than a, a jumping off point for your mind to understand what the grouping of things might mm -hmm. be, you know, and... Uh, Maybe a bungee jumping yeah. point? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, exactly, a bungee, of course. You know, so I mean, right away, and you, you're, you're taking people from, I don't know what to do, and the frighteningness of Marty Scalar's blank paper, to we've got to do something that really celebrates extreme sports in California. Mm -hmm. So it's also got that. So you've got now a nice box that, it sets into motion a lot of thinking that gets you right to bungee before, you know, instead of sitting there, out of all the things we could do for condors, you know, you know, and, and besides condors, yeah, right. right. And so, you know, Pacific <laughs> Wharf, what is that other than boats? You know, it yeah, yeah. just doesn't yeah. give you any, like, what are the textures and the things yeah. that are, the smells, you know, going there. So that, to me, that was a big miss mm -hmm. uh, in the early California to not come up with definitions. I mean, Hollywood, probably mm -hmm. is the strongest one mm -hmm. but then they didn't decide is it insider hollywood so we're on the back lot right. or is this sunset or hollywood boulevard that you're walking Glamour down time and, yeah. and you look at it one way and it's kind of like real and then mm -hmm. over here there's girders and steel holding it up like mm -hmm. it's fake and so it it falls apart on that end that it's uh and i would have i would have gone in and really uh you know intensified it as real mm -hmm. i would have put a Broadway show down at the Hyperion and mm -hmm. gussied it up and made a, one of the best theaters in L.A. And mm -hmm. I think I would have turned the Muppet Theater into the El Capitan mm -hmm. and had our first run opening films always mm -hmm. in there. So it began to build this every great premiere, like should have been Mary Poppins mm -hmm. on that block. I think they did do Lone Ranger. Yeah, down there, right, but right. That, wasn't, that didn't help it that much. So. Yeah. Um, even though that's one of my favorite movies, but that's for another story. Um, so, yeah, I think the backstories, I think where we've gotten a little bit out of hand is people write these very complicated stories <clears throat> that need to be understood for you to walk through the space and get why the things are there. And that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be kept at a level where it helps you in conceptualizing, but you know, once it's now a thing, people have to walk through it and know intuitively what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, um, was it down in Florida, the nightclub area was called Pleasure Island. Pleasure yeah. Island. Mm -hmm. There was a thing about Mary was rather pleasure, and he did built this whole thing. And the guests are looking at rather modest facility buildings. You know, they're not something built 40, 50, 60 years ago and used for rum running and all this stuff that the story's told. And, it, you know, it's just, it's belabored to where people just want to go and dance, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you've you got to be careful if you're going to do a massive backstory like that. Like the Indy ride, you know, uh, at Disneyland, you know, you boil it down and we, we thought, okay, people are going to stand in line five hours at the beginning and now it's about an hour. Why? 
And so we came up with the thing that if you do everything we say, you'll get wealth, or eternal youth, mm-hmm. or visions of, tomorrow, of the future. And I, you, you look around the world, and people wait in line at Lourdes to be cured, and you know mm-hmm. they stand in Vegas for all hours to bet on horse races and mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. So there's you know a, a, a feeling strong in my mind that you know if we really could grant those things, that's a, a logical reason why all these people have come to the jungle and are yeah. lined up yeah. to go in it. But does the whole thing fall apart if you don't you know know that? No, it doesn't matter. I don't think. Ninety percent of people riding pirates know that. Oh, that's the mayor being dealt, dumped yeah, in the right. wall. It takes well, a, several then, rides yeah. to know that, that. And so, even the changes that have gone on there, they're so esoteric that the public, I don't think, reads that deep into those stories. Mm-hmm. That oh, the, the, they're auctioning off all of their uh, possessions now instead yeah, right. of the women for brides. It's all their cuckoo clocks and their jewelry <laughs> and all that. And well, why are the pirates? Buying the jewelry, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know anyway, they would just steal it. Pirate you know? steal. Yeah, so I don't know. I would, you know, I, I, I think you've got to have a backstory mm-hmm. just to give it a, a credibility. Uh, but it, once it becomes something you have to know in your head or the scene isn't readable, mm-hmm. yeah. then you've crossed the line. Mark Davis was the best at visual thinking, I think, of all the animators. Um, you take like the guy balancing the hats, mm-hmm. yeah. who's got one foot in the boat <laughs> and one foot on the land, and he's got he's taken stolen so many hats that he can't balance yeah. properly. And we can all identify with the fact he's stealing, yeah. the fact that he's <laughs> about to fall in the drink, and it's a pose that can go on endlessly, which is the limitations of audiometronics. Mm-hmm. Without it feeling contrived, and it reads instantly. Yeah, and it's instantly, yeah. Yeah. and you know, we don't need to know that his mother was a milliner, and he's taking these <laughs> to go and replenish her millinery supply. <laughs> that is the real, real backstory. Yeah. 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 Let's say that it is. So you heard it here first. This yeah. is it. Uh, another, you know, you know, Insider. moment of the pirate ride has been revealed for the first time. <laughs> It's the backstory. The, yeah. yeah, or the, the backstory. Back story. The, the backstory. Back oh, no, yeah. that is <laughs> that's as, as sane as anything else, yeah. I suppose. Well, one of the things I was going to ask that, that kind of uh, doing a little bit of a callback, you know, when you were talking about... Uh, as you're thinking about the lands and as you're thinking about, you know, well, what is Condor Flats? You know, what what is more of uh, extreme? What is the sports extreme? What is this? What is this? Um, one of the more important things, you know, um, that you have around here at your cabin is you have, you know, um, down at your other house and everything else is um, that I love seeing are uh, you're, you're so physically invested into building things yourself Mm -hmm. and one of the one of the most important things for for anybody who's part of spatial storytelling is being able to actually tell a complete story from beginning to end and it it backstory is part of it um but it's also finishing that up so so neatly and it's all the little details so you know looking at it from a child's point of view as they walk into that space of thinking, okay, what is what is this seven year old who's never mm-hmm, been here before? Mm-hmm. What are they thinking? And and is it also going to be accessible for ADA? Now, architecturally, w- how is this going to fit together? And every, so, being more Renaissance, um, I mean, how many skills, you know, to basically, if you were to tell somebody now to do what you do, and somebody says, oh man, you know, how how can I do what you do? <laughs> we're like, well, you have to live an entire lifetime to acquire all these. But yeah. you know, how, uh, I don't know. What's what's your? Uh, That's a. <laughs> I don't know. It's no. a statement question, I guess. But. I do think there's something, and I don't know how to put my finger on it either, because um, I have a friend down in the other house who says, you know, I'll, I'll buy something new, and it's sitting there like, you know, a prop from the movie The Ten yeah. Commandments or something. And I, my house is not Egyptian, but here <laughs> are these Egyptian things. It's a museum. And she'll look at me and say, you know, I know I'm not worried about that being there because I know you have a knack for figuring out where it goes. Mm -hmm. And it might sit there for a year and then I come along. Like I just did an office and I love sideshow collectibles. (laughs) They make these, what are they, premium size figures of Captain America and Indiana Jones and whatnot. And I've had them scattered all over the house because, you know, where do you put them? And I I finished (laughs) an office and I decided the theme of that room or the story backstory yeah. is going to be that it's heroes. Yeah. It's where I'm going to do my work and I'm going to surround myself with 
you know, heroes. So, you know, if you go way back, it's Lincoln and Moses. And uh, I don't. I probably. That, oh, we're, we'll we'll get that. It's only, the it's only two rings. It is. Hello, it's the neighbor. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Keep Hi, going. Is this Dylan? Yeah. And where are you? We're not listening in on Tony's conversation. <laughs> we're talking amongst ourselves. Well, why why don't you go down to the. Um, I'm doing a giant. I'm doing a giant podcast, and you just interrupted one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> Hi, six <everyone>. people. <laughs> Dylan is apologizing from Universal. Uh, dear. Hi, Dylan. We'll we'll have you on next. We'll get you on a podcast here <laughs> for telling the secrets of Universal's design. Now, would you right. restate that long? No, I, yeah, I think yeah. I, I've got So we're coming one. back after Tony's uh, very important phone yeah. call about dinner plans. Well, this was supposed to be dinner plans, yeah. not a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, we were talking about the ability to take discordant things and bring them together to tell a consistent story mm-hmm. or at least feel compar- compatible with one another. Mm-hmm. And so I was putting my office together and I thought... I've got all these things scattered all over and, you know, there's three rooms that aren't saying anything. And so I decided the office is going to be, you know, all around the people that have inspired me, the heroes I've had through my whole life. And that goes back to Lincoln. And, and of course, before Lincoln opened at Disneyland, I was infatuated with uh, DeMille's Moses. Yeah. I just, mm-hmm. Before, there, was, there weren't science fiction movies of the sense that we have today, or Marvel and Lucasfilm and, and everybody since 2001 has had the capability to amaze you with incredible effects. The Ten Commandments did that back. Mm-hmm. And you had to wait through three hours of backstory, if you know. <laughs> because you've seen me do this over and over again, and you still don't believe. So stand back and behold, and then the ocean parts and all yeah. this stuff. So Moses is a real, especially Charlton Heston Moses, yeah. is a really big yeah. superhero to me. Oh, yeah. And then Mary Poppins, you know, mm-hmm. I thought, you know, she in a way saves this family, and the new movie is even better at doing that. In a, in a way, it's not. I'm not saying it's better than the original movie, but it's a damn good movie, and she is in the same position. So, and then you go on up into the more modern ones. Indiana Jones changed my life, mm-hmm. um, and so I've put together this room of heroes, you know, and I've got, you know, posters and you know sideshow things and a bust from the guy that did the Lincoln figure for Disneyland um, and some Moses things, of course. And and so it, now you look at it and you go, that works. I get, I get the story of what is linking all these things, where if you had Captain America in the room downstairs and Indy in the TV room, because he's a, a character you see in movies, and mm-hmm. um, Moses in the living room area because he's kind of generic and mm-hmm. fits there. It, it doesn't. It's not telling a story. So um, bringing them together, I think, is it gets to this non-threatening backstory that's so complicated that nobody can figure it out. It's just, I know when people walk in, there's a linkage between all these images that Mm -hmm. um, brings it kind of together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's certainly more interesting than the desk with all my bills on it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, at some level, that does strike me as a difference between Disney parks that kind of seem to have a Mm -hmm. central soul Mm -hmm. and a thesis uh, and non-Disney, i.e. maybe Mm -hmm. some uh, other motion picture-based parks that seem to be more of a collection of IPs that lawyers or I can't remember what movie I um, saw this year in the derby of what's coming up for Oscars. Um, But everything in the room did not, nothing worked. There were lots of expense put into designing this room. (laughs) And I sat there and I just drifted right out of the story and the actors, I was going, Whoever put this room together didn't know what they were doing. It's like just discordant, and the colors weren't didn't work or anything like that. And then I watched another one the other night called The Green Book, and it's a great film. And the fellow in that that's the pianist, and he has this very exotic room that looks like Indiana Jones lived in there, yeah. or something with a throne and all this nice. stuff. And before you, you're in the movie, you're going to learn his personality, but. 
on that first look when he invites this guy he's hired to do uh, his driving walks in and the guy is like going oh my god you know <laughs> and it's so it tells so much story i mean yeah. they don't have to say what what is your background and what, where did you come from and what is all this mm -hmm. you get it it's yeah. all right there laid out it's all harmonious it all works together and it's mm -hmm. all very discordant and different things but they all the art works direction good. on it is is flawless you know mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that's a skill that uh, I don't know how to explain how you develop it or you do it. And, <coughs> excuse me, it's not always uh, possible to just sit down on, on the day you acquire something to figure it out. You know, it's like oftentimes you'll walk in a year later and I've been looking at that for a year. It's in the wrong place. You know, that goes over here and this does this and and then it sort of happens. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. There's uh, not a lot of us in the industry right now that are working on uh, theme park projects that aren't tied to an mm -hmm. IP. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of uh, new lands, it, it generally seems to be the the battle of the bands and the battle of the yeah, IPs. Yeah. And kind of that's. <laughs> do you think that this is a season? Do you think that uh, there's uh, again pros and cons with that approach, uh, or do you think uh, that this is going to be it for the foreseeable futures? Well. It you know, it comes down to this. You can make a good ride either way or a good attraction. Mm -hmm. You know, I've I've worked with attractions that created IP. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. <coughs> excuse me, I'm talking myself out. Uh, we did an attraction for Epcot called Journey into Imagination. It is not the attraction that's there now. Uh, it's been removed for like 18 years, uh, but there are people that grew Tony up. Tony just with, washed his hands. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very sad story, and we don't have enough time to go into it. But the original creation of that for the opening of Epcot brought two very different, dissimilar characters, a little purple dragon and a steampunky old guy, together, and they fed off of each other's differences, you know, mm -hmm. and through the two differences, you were able to create a world, and... Figment, in a very compromised role down in Epcot, is still their number one selling plush thing and, and toy and T-shirt and hats and because he, he scores with people. So it's even possible to create IP. But in doing an attraction to do that, we came up with an attraction that allowed the guests to be in a theatrical relationship with the characters yep. as opposed to a ride relationship. Mm -hmm. When you ride through a ride, um, the easiest kind are like Peter Pan and Snow White and whatnot, because you go, there's Snow White, there are the dwarfs, there's the witch. In uh, a ride where you're introducing new characters like Figment and Dreamfinder, oh, there's a rubber dragon and a funky old man. You know, if you don't have a way of explaining that theatrical mm -hmm. backstory. Yep. So we created a scene that allowed you to be in sync with those characters for about four minutes while they really spilled their whole story and how Figment was created and what yeah. Dreamfinder is doing, and then inviting you to join them on a journey. And it was the most uncanny. Th First of all, you couldn't figure out how we were doing it. And you'd have to ride it one or two times to say, are we moving or is that moving or how are they, you know. And But then eventually it sunk in and the story and the endearment of Figment uh, to the audience became something that allowed it to go the opposite way and become uh, IP that is now merchandising IP. And I would love to see the company do the Figment movie. I think it would be a runaway hit. With And, and as you know, Marvel did, um, I believe, six or nine... Uh, uh, you know, individual comic, uh, you know, episodes of their adventures uh, leading up to the opening of the pavilion at Epcot. Mm -hmm. You know, so it took them back to where Dreamfinder wasn't an old guy, but a, a young, ad daring adventure yeah, in right. the 20s. And uh, they were great. And they, they sold better than any non-IP uh, Marvel comics, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, it did have a, a sense of uh, awareness that was from the theme park thing. So mm -hmm. it can go that way, and those are fun to do. Big Thunder was fun to do. Um, and then on the other end, who wouldn't dream of getting to do Indiana Jones yeah. as a ride? I mean, like, mm -hmm. those are like my five best years mm -hmm. ever, you know, going up there and, you know, playing with the, the, the clothing in the yes. Lucas warehouse <laughs> and saying, well, I think I'll just try on this. Jacket, you know, yeah. like, you know, you know. I'm still jealous of it. Yeah, that. and things like that. Uh, you know, this, this here's this whip. You know, that's pretty cool. And here's a Sankara stone. And, you know, so you know that is 
pretty cool. Yeah. And and again, being an absolute fanatic about the movies, you're yeah. you're you're ahead of the game in knowing what it was about them that turned people on, yeah. you know, and didn't turn on. And what you know, we had certain things we looked at and said, you have to deliver that. And it doesn't matter if it's sort of a repeat, it has to be in it or it won't be authentic. Mm-hmm. And George understood that. The first time we had that discussion was on Star Tours. And I was adamant we have the trench run. And uh, ILM, it was, we don't want to do the same thing again, rebuild the same shot and have to do it again. So they had a new thing, but it didn't give you that goosebump moment where as the ship peels down and then it leveled out in the trench and it had to kind of wobble to get going in. Mm -hmm. And even at the Grauman's Chinese, when I saw that in the movie came out, the first film, uh, we're all sitting there just going, oh, my God. You know, like that was just like you waited for that moment in the film, you know, of like and in. So I remember ILM said, we're not going to change what we come up with. So if you want it to go back, you have to get George to tell us to do it. Yeah. So I was sort of pitted and I made my plea that that will authenticate this attraction. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, we did a lot of things that were new and not done before in that movie. But. The trench shot was capped by RX, the pilot, saying, I've always nice wanted, wanted to do this. Yeah. And like everyone in the theater is saying the yeah, same, same thing, same. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I felt that was really important. Yeah. And with Indy, uh, the rolling ball, mm-hmm. it carries the same thing. It had to be there. Yeah. It had to be there. Yeah. And uh, it was so powerful that it shouldn't be the first thing you see. It's got to be the finale. And I remember they used the same track that's in the Indy building for the dinosaur ride that's in Florida. And Michael Eisner had taken his ride through there, and uh, he gets to the end. And he thinks in a very more holistic way than the people that were focused on their dinosaur ride. And he goes, where's the rolling ball? Oh. You know? and, and they go, well, what do you mean the rolling ball? That's the Indy ride. He goes, no, you don't get it. The rolling ball is the finale, and it's right there in front of your face at the end. And they had just used the dip, but they hadn't come up with anything That's there. So terrifying. <laughs> Within one week, they had put in the dinosaur head that was static that week that it opened. And then very quickly, they had an audiometronic thing that came That's flying right. out, a big uh, Tyrannosaurus that... Yeah you know, scored there at the end because Michael had it in his mind, that is the rolling ball moment yeah, of this yeah, attraction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I thought, that's really interesting. You know, he's categorized the rolling ball as a finale, <laughs> a finale <laughs> and you don't have a rolling ball, oh, you know. Yeah. So uh, I that was why I really enjoyed working with him because I think that's my thing, too, that we have to have that moment here at the end that... Uh, totally shocks you yeah. you know and you go there's no way out there is no way out of this scene and then Back. you know <laughs> wow well i want to get us to the wrapping up point but uh we do have a lot of just kind of close it out with this this uh exploration so we have a lot of our listeners who are they're either students of or they're they're tea next gen or they're trying to uh get into the industry and i'm sure you've been asked the question before how how do you become an imagineer but i i've heard i've heard it from way too many people that it's well you learn how to do something well and you just do it so i wanted to kind of explore with you a little bit more you know you you've talked about the importance of being twelve and the idea that uh, that a st- uh, we just lost all of our light. You that's want okay. me to ramp it up? Uh, sure. We, no, hurt. that's okay. It's okay. The the lights all went out and <laughs> it's on a timer. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So they, nobody can answer that question. How do you become an Imagineer? The, what they can a- ask you the question is how do you get involved in this and make the most of a career in uh, themed entertainment. I think that's some better. Well, I think the answer is how do you become yourself? Mm -hmm. Because you can be an Imagineer at your company or at my company or wherever you are. It's a skill set that you've cultivated in yourself that's marketable in a certain way. And, uh, you know, I certainly never dreamed as going through school and all that that I was going to go there. I was preparing to be a teacher. 
And uh, I thought that's a logical thing and it's a a goal my parents would approve of and uh, all of the things you do. And so I was working at Disneyland and, you know, I love Disneyland. And I thought, going to teach, we'll work at Disneyland on the weekends as a teacher and I'll be happy. And uh, so someone said, saw some of my work and they said, you know, you should take that up to the studio. And I'd say the one in that I had, because I certainly didn't know anyone, was that uh, one of the managers at Disneyland, and this was when it was a much smaller company. He goes, "Well, I'm going. I'm going up to Wed next week, which was the name that uh, Creative Area was called." And he took my stuff, and they brought me in, and they said, "You're not ready for this. You're not skilled enough, you know, in your talent to draw. You need to go to school." But we see something here, and that uh, we we think you should get out of the school you're in now and go to into an art school which I did, and I went back and they hired me to build models. Um, I think that it's a very different world today. The company that I work for, worked for is much bigger, and they don't hire people in that um, you'll be a model builder and in 40 years you'll get a Mickey Mouse watch and you'll be a designer. Yeah. You know, you either hire in what you want to do or you come and you go and, you know, project-based and all these other things. So that's kind of a downer on one side, but then the immediacy of media and everything today makes their new opportunities Mm -hmm. to get seen and to get your products and things out there in ways that, you know, you could spend a year trying to find something back Mm -hmm. in that era if you were a prop finder or whatever. Uh, I can go online today and find anything I want, you know. So, you know, there's, you, you, you can't say, oh, it's too bad it's not the way that it used to be. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder to get in. You're not going to get in and and grow the way that you know it was possible to do then. You're going to have to get in with a skill set that somehow you've been able to uh, make the world aware of mm. in some way. Um, doesn't have to be on a grand scale, but in some way uh, there needs to be something there that um, is supportive of your talent. And I think the companies have gone a lot you know, in the opposite direction of helping students. I mean, we we had a class at UCLA in Imagineering, and all of those students got to present their projects at Imagineering. They were criticized by all of the, critiqued is a better word, (laughs) by all of the key people. I did it for many years. They would send all of us down there to do lectures for the class. Um, CalArts is is a school that is, you know, funded heavily by Disney. Uh, and uh, a lot of people there at a high school level. There's the Ryman Arts Foundation that Herbie Ryman and Marty Scalar were instrumental in starting where high school kids are given some basic um, background on how you might go forward with a career that way. So those things didn't exist, you know, in the old days. Um, There's a lot more competition, but then as your company uh, is in business, there weren't multiple companies doing the same thing. There's Mm -hmm. ThinkWell and there's Hedema organization mm-hmm. and countless others. The Wonderful. TEA has a book this thick yeah. of mm-hmm. companies that do this kind of work in Europe and in Asia and here in America. So, you know, um, sometimes people have to think, you know, it might be better to get my feet wet, you know, at a, at a smaller company and do something that I can then leverage to go on into. The, 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 the Disney's and the Universal's mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. forth. You know. By the way, we're hiring. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And the, by the way, the, the guy that you sat across the table from this morning at Waffles, yeah. uh, someone that came in as an intern, we hired him just because he had some construction fabrication yeah. background, never went to art school, even though his dad was an artist. Mm-hmm. And he's actually one of our top art directors. He's amazing. Great. I mean, yeah. he is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th- those, those opportunities are there. Yeah. And it's yep. like I said, it's uh, it's a whole new world. Uh, but you can market yourself so much better with the access to these things too. So that um, if you want to create a website or a blog or whatever yeah. or a podcast, <laughs> um, these are these are tools again that you know in Wall Day he might walk by Harriet or Fred in the shop there and say, "Oh, this is Harriet and this is Fred." And I remember watching the TV and going, man, that would be the <laughs> end all be all. But I never knew who they were. Yeah. You're giving me an hour here to talk about me. Yeah, that's and crazy. So people are hearing these things. So that's in itself, 
you know, something that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. They were all like mystery people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a Harriet, that's a Fred, but I don't know <laughs> what they do or how they live or what <laughs> anything about them. I never will, you yeah. know, until I actually worked with them. Yeah. And I went, you know, you'd sit there doing your desk thing and you'd look over and you'd go, that's Harriet. She was standing there with Walt Disney in that room, like building that thing, yeah. you know, and that, that, that's that, tremendous. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much. Any last words? Any uh, uh, thing what to go out to, on? To spend the day with you, Tony. It I mean, really is. is. What a, an honor. It'll be just a little part of your Christmas tradition here. Up yeah. In, uh, your, your little well, bit you, of Bavaria. You guys kicked me in the rear to get this going this year. I, I'm glad I did. I've got people coming in in about an hour, one. And then they'll start straggling in tomorrow. And by tomorrow night, we'll have 10. Man. And uh, This is great. We put on a fire, maybe, and then... And, and, uh, watch movies all night. Yeah, it's about as Christmas yeah. as you get in Southern yeah. California. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, usually we'll have some snow, and uh, I'm kind of glad we didn't add that, because ice on my driveway can be nasty, uh-huh. so I'm glad that we got up here and it's nice and dry. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, we hope to have either you on again, or you 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 bring us onto your podcast whenever you do that. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great time. It's been fun.